Thank you, Larry. I'm Connie Chung. Here's what's happening at this hour. CNN has learned of the first U.S. fatalities in the attack on Iraq. A Marine's CH-46 C-9 helicopter, the same model in this file footage you see here, has crashed in Kuwait carrying 16 people. There are fatalities. We just don't know how many at this moment. CNN's Walter Rogers reports that the 7th Cavalry is rolling north, virtually unopposed through the deserts of Iraq. You're seeing tanks and other military vehicles, or you will in just a moment. What you would not be seeing are the scouting helicopters flying low ahead of the convoy. In northern Iraq, coalition forces bombed the Iraqi-held city of Mosul, and anti-aircraft artillery reportedly returned fire. However, the Pentagon put its so-called shock and awe campaign, that's the major military strike, on hold to assess the aftermath of its initial strikes against Baghdad. In Kuwait tonight, vivid evidence that Iraq's military has not been idle. Several shells have landed in Kuwait, and you are about to see the recent response to air raid sirens sounding there. In just a short while, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had spoken with reporters and hinted at possibilities for surrender by the Iraqi rank and file as well as the Iraqi leadership. He said the U.S. has private communications ongoing with elements of the Iraqi military, urging them to lay down their arms. And tonight, there are indications some of the Iraqi soldiers are doing just that. The war in Iraq has led to fighting here in the States, as you will be able to see in just a few moments. I hope we have that tape. Violence broke out in San Francisco as protests spilled into the streets there and protesters clashed with onlookers. Police also reported more than a thousand arrests there. Also, there were protests in the streets of Chicago and in the streets of Los Angeles as well. Sorry, we don't have any of that tape. Overseas, students and other South Korean protesters were heading toward the U.S. Embassy and clashed violently with police blocking their way. Continuing our coverage of Strike on Iraq, now with Aaron Brown. Aaron? There we go, Connie. Thank you and good evening again, everyone. A good reminder today as a battle plan unfolded that certainly did not follow the contours that we expected, the defense secretary this afternoon was asked why we hadn't yet seen that shock and awe and it brought out his usual bite. He said, I don't believe you have the war plan, a fact he added, which does not make me unhappy. Indeed, we don't have the war plan or know where this is all going. All we can do is keep up with the facts on the ground as best we can, and they are moving quite quickly tonight. In your screen now, in the large picture, that is Baghdad as the sun rises. It is dawn now, 6 o'clock, 6.01 on Friday morning in Baghdad. Five million residents there, and what must they be thinking? Um, also, you can see Kuwait City uh, over on the top of your screen to the left, a city that is also quite nervous because it knows full well that it could be attacked, it might be attacked, and in fact throughout much of the day the air raid sirens in Kuwait City went off for fear that the Iraqis would throw missiles their way. Uh, down in the middle another shot of Baghdad and down at the bottom of the screen, and I'm not sure if we can take that into the larger box or not, but that is a picture, live picture of the 7th Cavalry as it moves through the Kuwaiti, correct me, as it moves through the Iraqi desert, uh, they have crossed the border from Kuwait into Iraq. They had a bit of resistance. It took about two hours to manage the resistance. Again, these are live pictures. Think about uh, the significance, the, the, the technology and all the rest of these young cavalry men moving their tanks and uh, heavy armor through the, the Iraqi desert, ultimately their destination the outskirts of Baghdad. How long it'll take them to get there, they are the forward edge, the tip of the spear, as they say. Uh, behind them, a large infantry will ultimately come closer, but they will lead the way. They don't want to get too far in front of that, but they are making their way, and as we go along, we'll talk with Walt Rogers, we hope. Walt is one of the embedded reporters, and Walt is with that group. Um, we begin our coverage, however, in this hour 
with the worst of news. Um, they're the first casualties on the American side. We can now report Jamie McIntyre is at the Pentagon. Jamie, we have some detail now on this helicopter accident, correct? Right. And the first casualties come not from combat, but from an accident. Uh, sometimes some, one of the deadliest parts of, uh, of the U.S. military operation is simply uh, the training and the logistics and all the things they have to deal with. What happened was about, uh, about 7.40 p.m. our time, a Marine helicopter, a CH-46E, carrying uh, 16, with 16 people on board, crashed about nine miles south of the Iraq-Kuwaiti border. Uh, there was a mix of American and British troops on board, 16 people altogether, no survivors, no indication that this was a result of hostile fire. It appears to be some kind of mechanical malfunction or, or other, uh, other problem. Uh, they, of course, at this point, they're still unsure what caused the crash, but there are no survivors. Uh, Reuters is saying that of the 12 on board, uh, of the 16 on board, 12 were U.S. and four were British. Uh, there's some, been some com confusion about that, so we're trying to sort those numbers out to make sure they're correct. Uh, but nevertheless, 16 people, including American and British troops, killed in the crash of the CH-46 helicopter. All right, Jamie, go ahead and clear your throat or cough what you need to do here. Um, and tell me if my memory is right. My recollection of the first casualties in Afghanistan is that it was an accident as well. This is, this is difficult and dangerous work even before they get into combat. Yeah, I don't, re I don't recall exactly, but I do know that more people died in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan as a result of accidents than died as a result of hostile fire. Of course, that was a very different kind of operation here, and how many casualties actually result from war depends ex <laughs> really on how much the Iraqi troops uh, put up resistance, and that's the, really one of the big questions at the moment. And um, there was another accident uh, it was a week or so ago where four Americans died in a similar sort of situation. It was a helicopter accident. Just, again, to underscore that even before you get into combat, there are plenty of risks out there. The sand, the dirt, all of it makes this very tough going uh, for these young men and uh, women who are out there as well. In fact, there were two other uh, helicopter accidents today. There was an MH-53 Special Operations helicopter that had a hard landing. Uh, it had to be destroyed on the ground after the crew and the uh, soldiers on board were rescued, uh, were taken out of there. And then uh, later in the day today, there was an Apache attack helicopter that also had to put down at a hard landing. They were able to take off again and return to their base safely. Jamie, thanks. Again, um, we're not precisely sure of uh, the nationalities of everyone, we believe. Uh, uh, mostly Americans that would stand to reason. A Marine helicopter has gone down in an accident on the Kuwaiti side of the Iraq-Kuwaiti border. Um, and we'll, we'll work out um, the number of Americans and the number of British soldiers who, or in Marines who died in the accident and as next of kin are notified, and that's a process that can take some time, then we will uh, be able to tell you who they are and honor them in a more appropriate way than simply to say that 16 people died uh, in an accident in the desert this morning, morning in, uh, in Kuwait at least. Um, again, down in the corner of your screen, what you are seeing is the 7th Cavalry on its way to Baghdad, how quickly and what it will encounter as it gets there, we do not know, but we know what has happened so far because CNN's Walt Rogers has been riding with them. Walt, um, Tell us, you don't need to tell us location, but tell us what you can about what you have encountered to date. The pictures you're seeing are absolutely phenomenal. These are live pictures of the 7th Cavalry racing across the deserts in southern Iraq. They will, uh, it'll be days before they get to Baghdad, but uh, you've never seen battlefield pictures like these before. Immediately in front of our cameras, an M1A1 Abrams tank. We're sitting 30, we're sitting about 30 meters, uh, now about 40 meters off the back of that tank. You can see that they've got water bottles st stacked on board. That's how close we are. The orange cover on the back is called a VS-17. That's a visual identification marker for Allied aircraft in the air to let them know this is the 7th Cavalry. These are friendly units. We are rolling through the desert. Speed here probably 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. 
That's been our speed most of the time. A short while ago, perhaps 30 minutes ago, this unit uh, took some uh, incoming fire, never came uh, within more than half a kilometer of the 7th Cavalry, but uh, there you can see these tanks rolling along. The Army says these are the most lethal killing machines on the earth, and uh, when you see those 120 millimeter guns go off, there's no doubt about it. There he's swinging the turret. There, that constant swinging of the turret is to uh, maintain a state of alertness. As you look at the soldiers atop the tank, the one nearest us, on the left side of the tank is the loader. He is responsible yeah. for loading the 120 millimeter uh, shell, gun shells into the tank when it engages in hostile uh, combat. That has not occurred. That is, the tanks have not fired, to the best of our knowledge, so far today. The other uh, uh, soldier on the right side of the uh, turret, his head sticking up to, is uh, the commander of the tank. You have to realize they've been riding along, bouncing along in these tanks for probably six or more hours now. Those two on top are standing. The driver is, if you can look on the left front side, the driver is in a reclining position by that slash 91 figure. He's in a two-thirds reclined position. And then deeper inside the tank, and if you ride inside that tank, it is like riding in the, uh, uh, the bowels of a, of, of a dragon. They roar, they screech. You can see them slowing now. We've got to be careful not to get in front of them. Uh, but what you're watching oh, here shot. is truly historic television and journalism. This is live pictures uh, of the 7th U.S. Cavalry headed for Iraq. This is actual time. What you are witnessing now is what is happening here in the Iraqi desert as the 7th Cavalry, part of the 3rd uh, Infantry Division, is moving northward through the Iraqi desert. We should tell you that some of the... Uh, some of the uh, uh, squadron is uh, uh, now completely fanned out. This is the Apache troop. Earlier in the evening when we crossed the border with Kuwait, we were in a single column. The reason being we stayed in a single column because there was concern about minefields. But now we are well past the danger of minefields. The entire Apache troop of the U.S. Army 7th Infantry uh, our 7th Cavalry is spread out in this giant fan across this desert plain. There are two other troops in the 7th Cavalry. Uh, B Troop is Bone Crusher, and C Troop is the Crazy Horse Troop. But we've been riding with the Apache Troop. Back to you. Uh, don't, don't go away. Let me ask you, how long have they been on the move? What point did they cross the border? How long ago? Let me check my watch. Uh, my my guess is we crossed the border three and a half to four hours ago. And Again, there our was speeds vary. Uh, we go qu sometimes we're going as fast as 40 kilometers an hour, maybe even faster. And remember, these tanks can go 84 kilometers an hour. But the support they ha can't get out too far in front of the support vehicles, the tankers which are following behind them. And um, um, while there was, I know from your earlier reporting. Uh, when they first crossed the border, or shortly after they first crossed the border at least, there was some uh, resistance that slowed things down. Can you describe that for us? Actually, that was just before they crossed the border. They were about to cross the border, and there was uh, some hostile action, is what uh, one officer told me, from the Iraqi side of the border. Uh, we're not exactly sure how the engagement uh, unfolded. It is possible that the Kiowa helicopters, which fly out in front ahead of us, may have been the first to engage the hostile Iraqi unit, or it may have been the Bradley fighting vehicles, or it may have been these tanks. But we were told, and this is unofficial, and uh, it, 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 it might be somewhat inaccurate, but we were told that six Iraqi trucks were taken out. Uh, also, we just passed an old Iraqi uh, T-54 tank. Uh, that was here from a previous war. Uh, all, earlier this evening, also, we, uh, uh, we think an unknown number of tanks were hit, no more than three or four, but uh, that was really little more than a skirmish. It held the 7th Cavalry up at the border briefly until the lane of passage through the border berm could be cleared. Once that border berm was cleared, they moved through very, very quickly. Uh, if, uh, if you stay with us just a little longer, we're coming up on another skeleton of another war, another old Soviet vintage tank 
that the Iraqis would have used probably during the Gulf War. Uh, you can see it. You're just about to see it on the ground there. The turret, it, did, it would have been knocked out by uh, Allied forces in the 1991 Gulf War. And look at that old Soviet tank and then pan over and look at the uh, M1A1 Abrams if you want to see how the history of mechanized warfare has in the last 15 years. Back to you. It's amazing, you know, uh, General Wesley Clark is with us. Uh, there are so many things when you look at those pictures to talk about, for one thing, the vastness of the desert. The only thing we see in looking at those pictures is this old tank. There's, there's nothing out there. You said to me, um, they're going too fast, slow down. Uh, explain, explain there's, a, there's a military concern here having to do with not getting too far ahead of the pack. Right? Well, that's right. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to see the formation break up, but right. I, that's up to the commanders on right. the ground. That's just my instinct. I spent a lot of time out at the National Training Center, and I've watched this adrenaline surge that people get, even in simulated combat. And, I mean, they're into something, and they want to go, and they want to get the mission done. And so the trick is to get them in control, get the energy harnessed and constructive and ready to go and, and really have the formation in the best balance when they do hit contact. All right, this is a cavalry unit. Tell me what a cavalry unit does. It's probably given a mission as an advance guard for the division. Um, it's at, out there uh, conducting an operation to locate enemy forces in front and to defeat those forces in order to prepare the way for the rest of the division's movement. It wants to be an hour, maybe two hours in front of the division. So the distance is less important than the time, really, because you want the rest of the division to be able to react if they hit any significant enemy contact. Their job is to find obstacles, find a way around it, find enemy resistance, either take it out or fix it and let the rest of the force react to it. What protects them? Who protects the cavalry? Well, in a sense, they aren't protected. I mean, they are the first element. But of course, they've got, they've got overhead imagery. And they know where they are through the global positioning system. And they're talking to the uh, Kiowa warrior helicopters that should be up flying on their flanks and maybe in front. Let me just hang on a second. I, these are live pictures, and what you're seeing here is a cameraman trying to orient himself or find a shot uh, through um, what's going on there. And I think there are moments um, like this where the only thing to say to you is bear with us. Um, these men who are shooting the pictures are doing the best they can. This thing's going about 40 miles an hour or so. Don't talk to me in kilometers. I did that already. Uh, 40 miles an hour or so. It's rocky. It's loud. It's, uh, it's difficult. And <clears throat> they're trying to get <clears throat> excuse me, some of the most extraordinary uh, pictures in many ways when you think of the moment they are in that you'll ever see. Um, when you look at this, are you dazzled by what you're seeing, in a sense? Well, I'm really proud of the yeah. men that are out there. Yeah, I think they're, well, we all are. they're fantastic. They've been through the best training program. They've got great equipment. They're great young men, and in this case, and probably a few women in the helicopters and back in the rear here. Yeah, I don't know how many job. people know that, but in fact, women do fly these helicopters. Absolutely. And, and uh, we, we met some of them when we were in Kuwait. Um, and they train and, and do all, they all do the same thing, and they're all treated the same way. They are. And they're all taking the same risks. Um, as you look at these pictures, as they make their way from uh, Kuwait, from the northern border of Kuwait, across the border now, I think Walt said they've been at it a little more than three hours. They make their way across the, the Iraqi desert. They went through a berm, which is um, uh, essentially it's like a big sand block or, or dam. Right. And how do they get through? The tank just roll over it? Depends on how big it is. Tank could roll over it. They could put a bulldozer with the engineers up in front and sort of cut it. It depends on, on how hard it is and, and so forth. Someone would have looked at it and made a decision. And they had some resistance as well reported. It didn't last terribly long and uh, no uh, casualties on the American side. Uh, this is an American unit. Do you know where the 7th Cavalry is based? This is a unit from uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia. Fort Stewart, Georgia, right. so not far from where we are sitting right now. Um, and they are making their way ultimately to Baghdad and one of the great questions, and at some point in a few days or a few weeks, who knows, 
we will know if what this comes down to is a very ugly and difficult battle for Baghdad. Will this sort of unit have any role in that sort of battle? Absolutely. What kind of role? Well, they're going to go right up to the, uh, they're going to make contact with the enemy. This is the first unit you want to have to make contact with the enemy, Aaron, because this is a unit that's got firepower, it's got mobility, it's got great communications, it's got air and ground capability, and you want it out there to be the first to figure out where the enemy is, how he's disposed, what's his strength, what's his intention, and then you use that information and you use the rest of the force against the enemy. So this guy's going to be up, this, this team's going to be up front. So I, I hope this, I'm not wording this badly, but look at that shot, how clear that shot is. You can. It looks to me like, is that an American flag on the side? Or am I just imagining that on the side? Uh, can't. It's you, hard to tell. Can't quite see. It's probably uh, an identification number. Uh, Most of these vehicles should be numbered because one of the tricky things when you look at this is they all look alike. Yes, they do. And even when you're close to it and everybody's got a helmet on, you can't see which vehicle it is. And it's one of the little points of friction. So we've learned to number the vehicles and put colored panels on the back. You could see in that shot just before um, all the antennas on uh, that particular vehicle. Um, it, it is not overstated to say the commanders in, in the, and, and planners sitting at laptop computers are like air traffic controllers trying to keep track of almost literally every piece of machinery out there, right? Right, and there's thousands of pieces of machinery out there. It's a very complicated battlefield when you're looking at the ground battlefield. Uh, back uh, several weeks ago, months ago maybe, I remember when we went and did a, a story in uh, Qatar as the Central Command had moved to Qatar and they had this exercise, this command and control planning exercise, and, it, and there was, of course, there was nothing to see. It was a bunch of guys and men and women right. uh, sitting in front of laptop computers, but this is what they were doing, right? They exactly. Were keep, they were keeping track of the battlefield. And we were talking, you and I were talking the other day about one of the, the, the concerns in this sort of military plan, this, which is, was described as a kind of simultaneous ground and air plan, is that it does increase the danger of friendly fire accidents, and therefore this air, in quotes, air traffic control function is hugely important. It, it is, but you know what we've got now is modern technology that does two things for us. Number one, we've got the global positioning system. So in the past, even in some of the units in the Gulf War, they didn't know where they were. They might go like this for 20 miles, or 20, 20 minutes at a high rate of speed, they'd look up and say, well, exactly where am I right now? They might be off by two or three miles, yeah. which is huge. Now they know. They know where they are. And the other thing is, for most of these units, we've got some degree of automatic reporting of that position location. So someone up above them knows, and somebody can say, whoops, call off the airstrike headed for this location, change the artillery, or they may tell them, slow down because our artillery's not keeping up. So we've got a lot better management and control of this force than we've ever had in the past. It's your worst nightmare as, as the general in a moment like this that you lose contact with uh, or communications with these units that are out there. Is that what makes you nervous? That's one of the things. The other thing, of course, is that they would get into contact and they themselves would lose internal command and control, not knowing where the other units are in their own team and be picked off individually by the enemy. I, I mean, if this is an appropriate question, just walk away from it. Can you, can you talk about how many, uh, you have a sense of how many tanks or how many people are involved in this, how much material is moving for people to keep track of? Well, in, in this team Apache here, you probably got 20 vehicles that are moving there and they're reporting to a squadron that's controlling uh, maybe 60 vehicles plus helicopters out front, plus a lot of stuff behind it. But that's complicated. And, and it's obviously not the only thing that's going on. That's right. It is the only thing that we see at this moment. And some of these uh, vehicles we see, that's an incredible shot, uh, that one. You see several vehicles moving across the desert. Um, we ought not ever lose sight of the fact that what we're talking about is war. And it's, it's, war is not just dangerous business, it's horrible business. Uh, it sometimes has to be done, but it doesn't, it's, not, it's never fun. And, whatever excitement there is in seeing a picture needs to be tempered by the reality of what war is and we don't uh, and I know that General Clark doesn't uh, because we've had these conversations we never lose sight of that but it's remarkable to see this unit make its way 
across the desert in real time, live TV, um, and and to, and to know that this is the, the tip of the spear, as they say, this is the beginning. This is the unit that will draw the first contact. And when that happens, as General Clark said, that will give positions away and allow others to come in and do their work. Jamie McIntyre, um, you've heard about all of this. You've talked to all the planners over time. You know how it's supposed to go. I can't imagine that uh, there's, there's nothing like seeing it, is there? I'm sorry, Aaron, are you talking to me at this point? I, I was talking to you, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Someone else was talking in my ear just before you. It's really remarkable to see these because, of course, this is uh, the beginning of the race to Baghdad, the march to Baghdad. Uh, behind this uh, scout unit is essentially the 3rd Infantry Division with all of their uh, armor and equipment. And, um, you know, it looks like they're going to basically uh, take this trek across the desert and uh, show up at the outskirts of Baghdad at the rate they're going here. We can't, of course, tell exactly where they are. Um, and it is remarkable that we're able to see this as, it, uh, as it's taking place live with that video phone uh, right on the back of a vehicle there. It's, um, it's pretty impressive. It is pretty impressive. Um, just tell me again, General Clark, how many men are, are in those units? In each one of these vehicles, you've got, of course, a four-man crew. Four-man crew. This, this is a troop, a cavalry troop. It's Alpha Troop. They call it Apache Troop. Probably got 100, 120 people in it. Um, they're all responsible for vehicles. They're all working on those vehicles when they're stopped, and, uh, and now they're moving together. They yep. probably got helicopters out in front, Aaron, and, and I would assume that they believe that they're relatively secure there and that's why they're moving at that kind of speed. If you really were about to make contact with the enemy, you wouldn't want to move faster than you could acquire and engage targets. And so for the tanks, they've got a stabilized gun and a stabilized sighting system. They don't shoot on the run. They do shoot they on do the run. Shoot the on tanks the run. do. Okay. And but there's an ideal speed you shoot at. It's 15 to 18 miles an hour depending on the terrain. But of course, it's only the gunner and the commander who can, at that point, actually see the targets. Where you're moving, at that speed, you don't have binoculars up. So the loader's up, he's looking, he would see the flash on the horizon if the enemy engaged, but he's not able to hang onto the tank any more than we can here, bouncing along like this and with 70 tons of steel wrapped around him and, and see tiny objects on the horizon. So my guess is the helicopters have already cleared a lot of that route. And it is the helicopters that provide them with their intelligence. Right. And these are very, these are uh, very low-flying helicopters, aren't right. they? Mm -hmm. yeah, they're really skimming. Uh, the, 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 and are these enlisted men or are they officers uh, uh, in, in this four-man crew? Are they enlisted men, by and large? Well, now, this is a platoon here that you're looking at these tanks. These are, these are enlisted men. And uh, you're going to have a star sergeant who's been in the Army maybe six, five, six, seven years as a tank commander. And you're going to have th three other people in that crew who may have been in the Army a year, two years, maybe Nine, three 18, years. 18, 19, 20-year-olds. These are young, young men. This is their first taste of battle. Uh, Walt, uh, feel free to join the conversation here as you, Walt Rogers, that is, make your way across the Iraqi desert, and we watch it. Hi, Aaron. We are uh, putting our cameraman, Charlie Miller, back on the uh, bonnet, the hood of this uh, Hummer, and uh, now you're getting an even better picture. The dust clouds you see in front of you are being kicked up by the M1A1 Abrams tank. Actually, the uh, dust cloud on the left is coming from the Apache troop commander, Captain Clay Lyle, of, uh, originally of Tampa, Texas. Uh, out in front of them, just over the horizon, we've been watching two of the Kiowa Warrior helicopters doing what's called zone reconnaissance. They're hovering no That's more than 50 see. feet above the deck, flying at probably 80 knots, and uh, they are very lightly armed vehicles, but what they're doing is flying a, a survey out in front of the tanks, which you see immediately in front of us. They may go as far as uh, six miles out, but usually they're closer, and they are there to alert the oncoming tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles to any possible hostile uh, forces ahead of them. Again, so far we haven't seen the, any hostile forces for 
probably half or three quarters of an hour, and these tanks are racing to Baghdad. If I may correct something one of your guests was saying a few minutes ago, I was talking to the tank commanders, and they say that the, the, the guns actually become more accurate the higher the speed. That is to say, there's a suspension which kicks in on those M1, A1, Abrams tanks so that at higher speeds, like uh, 40 miles an hour, they may fire more accurately than 20 miles an hour. And, of course, they can fire on the run. I should tell you a little bit about the ammunition they're carrying. Uh, the, the amount of shells they carry is uh, classified, but let's say clearly it's over three dozen, and it's about a two-thirds, one-third ratio. Two-thirds of them are what are called Sabo shells. Those are hard, armor-piercing shells that just pass, punch through a concrete bunker or punch through another tank. The others are high explosives, also, also very lethal weapons. We have not seen the uh, 7th Cavalry's tanks firing here because any engagements which might have taken place would have been far forward of us when we uh, crossed the border. But now we are riding with the 7th Cavalry, the Apache troop, and uh, I'm not sure. I think off to our left is the uh, C troop, which is Crazy Horse troop, and off to the right is the, uh, is the um, uh, Bone Crusher troop. So this is a very large for, uh, formation in the distance, perhaps through a dust cloud up there. I just saw another one of the Kiowa helicopters pop up. They're flying like fish hooks, fish hook formations. Uh, again, uh, flying reconnaissance for these oncoming tanks. There's, oh, there are the Kiowas there. You can see them. Uh, mm -hmm. We ought to have a very good picture of them now. Uh, Just the above the horizon The system line. is that little bulb atop the helicopters. By the way, in the, um, in the 7th Cavalry, there are two women uh, officers who meet, fly those helicopters, pilots. Uh, I didn't meet one. I know she's a West Point graduate. The one I met and worked with is uh, Lieutenant Sarah Fritz of Portland, Oregon. And she uh, says it's a real hoot flying those, she says, because when she flies those Kiowa helicopters, she told me she knows she's the first to see the uh, what she called the enemy out there, and uh, it is a real adrenaline rush. You asked earlier about the uh, the ranks of those. Uh, those helicopters are flown by junior officers, lieutenants as a rule, and warrant officers. Uh, they're, the units are led by uh, lieutenants, but it's often the warrant officers who are flying them as well. As for the tanks in a platoon, it's usually a, a lieutenant, a second lieutenant, or a first lieutenant who commands a platoon of tanks, and then everyone else commanding the, uh, everyone else driving the tanks are staff sergeants, and they are uh, exceptionally uh, professional soldiers, fine, uh, fine young men. The women of, do not uh, uh, travel in the uh, in the in the um, uh, in the tanks or the uh, Bradley fighting vehicles. Uh, female soldiers are, however, out there flying those helicopters in advance of the tanks. Uh, they, uh, and, and, and they say it's a real hoot to be uh, out there uh, leading this troop of tanks and leading these men uh, towards Baghdad. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, General, has um, this kind of uh, warfare, obviously the mechanics of it have changed. Have, have the, the strategies of tank warfare changed over time a lot? They change with the quality of the equipment. And so what we developed in the 1970s was the ability to actually fire on the move with the tank. Before that, the procedure was you would halt the tank. We call it fire from the short halt. So the first command of the tank was driver stop. The tank would stop and then you'd fire. Now you maintain a smooth movement and the tank fires. It's all stabilized in there, the sight, the gun, and so forth. So that's the first thing. Second thing is with better command and control, you can bring your forces together much more smoothly and you can synchronize the air, the artillery, the ground maneuver in a way that they couldn't do in World War II. That's, that's what I was thinking about in World War II. I mean, there's that sort of raw, I mean, anyone who, who loves to go to movies and has seen war movies over time, um, there is a sort of rommel in the desert quality to what we are seeing here. Um, but you have to imagine uh, the, the enormous difference it is they couldn't talk to them then. They couldn't talk to them, and those tanks that you see in the Africa Corps racing across the desert with the 37 millimeter guns of about one third the size or one fourth the size of this gun, uh, accurate out to 600 meters, this one's out to maybe 3,000 meters, they would stop, 
to shoot. This would move on. They had no night sights. We've got night sights. We see as well at night as we do in the day with these tanks. Uh, it's an entirely different kind of battlefield today, thanks to technology and good training of these troops. Jamie McIntyre. Aaron, as I watch these uh, remarkable pictures, the one thing that strikes me about what's going on here is that this really clearly shows that the ground war is well underway far in advance of the air war, except for those very limited cruise missile strikes. I'd be curious to know, uh, General Clark, what do you make of the fact uh, that this really seems to go against uh, sort of every convention of what we expected to happen, where there would be at least a simultaneous air and ground war, um, if not a air war, and, and then a short period after that we'd see the ground war start. But here we see uh, the tanks racing northward, and the air war really hasn't started, at least not yet. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's, you know, it's obviously working so far. This is enemy security zone. And we wouldn't have expected much air defense out in this zone. We've been flying over it for a long time, and there's absolutely nothing doctrinally wrong. And obviously, it's working here. It's moving ahead on the ground without having to, to wait for the air power to, to pound this area. There's nothing to strike in this area. Now, when we get up close to Baghdad, uh, then, then there's a choice. You could do uh, what we're, we've said before, which is a simultaneous attack, try to take out his air defense at the same time you're moving forward. You could pause the ground force, allow the force to close up, catch up um, in there, get back in battle formation, refit, rest a little bit, and then put the heavy airstrike in. Or you could actually use the ground force to attack at night and clean out the air defense in a way that would kind of open up the a corridor for the air to come through. So you've got a lot of different plays when you have this kind of a force and this much superiority over the enemy's capabilities. What's the stuff? You, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie, go ahead and follow it up. I, I'm just saying, I'm curious, do you think it was planned this way originally, or do you think this is uh, something that they've adapted now as they've taken a look at how things have unfolded, especially with those limited strikes first? Are they I, taking advantage of, uh, of what they see on the ground? hard to say because, of course, none of us have seen the plan and wouldn't have wanted to. But we always believed that they would move quickly and simultaneously. So um, we didn't get the big heavy air operation, but the big heavy air operation wasn't going to have any impact on the movement in this area anyway. They've gone ahead with this move. Something else is happening, of course, that we're not seeing over where Basra is. And Basra is the second largest city. Um, we know the Brits and we know uh, the Marines have moved in that area. We don't know exactly what is happening over in Basra. Presumably, they're in there trying to sort out the situation. It was a militarized area. Also, it was an area where there was tremendous fighting in 1991 after the Gulf War Yes. when the Shiites tried to react. And uh, so th that's, probably, uh, that's probably where the action is right now in the sense of hand-to-hand -hand, you know, engagement. And to the extent that any of us really knew the plan, and I think all of us are wondering how much we really knew the plan. Um, Basra was a very important city in the plan to take, to take early. Um, this population there, the Shia population there, uh, was considered uh, most unfriendly to Saddam Hussein. There was a sense uh, that if they could get to Basra, they would be well received, if they could get there quickly and establish an important, uh, I'm going to use the wrong term here, beachhead there, but uh, a location there uh, from which operations could then move. Um, I just, I, I mean, look how clear, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to gee whiz uh, you all to death here, but just look how clear that picture is of uh, that movement across the desert. What, what is to stop the Iraqis from watching CNN and saying, look at those tanks coming, let's send up some airplanes and take them out. Well, first of all, they are, part, they are watching CNN. And it's, it must be incredibly demoralizing to them. We just blew through their security zone. And that was their doctrinal way of knowing where we were and slowing us down. That was the three or four tanks mm -hmm. and a few trucks that were dispatched like that by this force. But when it comes to taking aircraft off, and they, they don't know where this is. We don't know where this is, and they don't know where it is. And when those aircraft go to the, go to the airfield, we're watching those airfields. We've got radars that are trained on those airfields, and when those aircraft start to lift off, bingo, they're dead. They're out. They'll never get there. They don't, they don't have a lot of airplanes left, and I suppose they don't want to lose them in this sort of situation. Well, it'd be a total loss because... Uh, if you did send aircraft up here, they'd never get this far. There is, and, and just to put a, a, a period on that, 
it is it is hard in many ways to visualize until you're out there. We were out there a month ago. The vastness um, and uh, and and how barren this desert is. Um, to to say it stretches of, for as far as the eye can see is about the biggest understatement I've ever made in my life on television. I mean, it just it, it seems this endless sea of sand, um, and and so this is one small path being drawn in that vast sea of sand. Walt. Hello, Aaron. We just passed a wonderful vignette, a huge Bedouin tent, open-facing. We saw uh, three, four family, maybe of six or eight people in there, and all these tanks were rolling by them, and they were just sitting there, dumbfounded, these Iraqi hmm. Bed Bedouin tribesmen and tribeswomen, and they were just shaking their heads as these clouds of dust in this huge modern mechanized armored unit is rolling past them. We really need to give a plaudit at this point to our cameraman, Charles Miller, who's bouncing on the hood of this, uh, of this Humvee and uh, taking these magnificent and historic pictures for us. The camera, the, the uh, tank he is focusing on now is of uh, Captain uh, Clay Lyle, of, uh, uh, originally of Pampa, Texas. Uh, Captain Lyle is the commander of Apache Troop and Apache Troop is the unit in the 7th Cavalry, which is leading the 7th Cavalry onward and forward in the race toward Baghdad. Aaron? General, what do they feel? And you, you've been in situations like this. You were a young man not that long ago in a moment like this. Their hearts racing. Well, Captain Law is very proud of this. He's very proud of the troops. He's very proud to be in command. He knows it's, um, it's something that he's never going to do again maybe but it's something that he's 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 wondered how he would do at this he's feeling good about it they got off they did well he's in communications he's in control he's a he's captain anxious. it's not likely that he was in the first gulf war correct probably not right. probably uh we don't know how old he is maybe 27 28 right. something like that and uh and he's enormously proud he's very concerned he knows every one of these people in this unit by name he knows their families uh many of them are married uh, and he wants to bring every one of them back safely, and he wants a mission done. And those 19-year-olds, uh, 18, 19, 20-year-olds are there, uh, hearts racing. Are they thinking about all those hours of training and, that have been going on probably up to and including uh, yesterday, if not the day before yesterday, to get prepared for this moment? Um, a little fear, a lot of adrenaline, the whole thing. I hope they're doing that. I really do. But you never know because they're also probably pretty tired. They've been. This is probably the second night they've moved without rest. They were awake uh, moving in an attack position last night. Uh, they got some shut eye during the day, probably yesterday. And that would they be in a, tank. In, a in a tank. In a tank. Uh, yeah, no, no tent, no sleeping bag out on the ground, probably uh, in their seats sleeping. and. And um, it's confining, it's noisy, it's deadening inside that tank. They've got a helmet on, they're chattering to each other. Uh, the driver's not going to go to sleep, uh, but you've got to have everybody alert as long as possible. And it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of training to keep that alertness up. Hope Walt, they're ready. Walt, did the captain, uh, before they, they moved out, rolled out, did he talk to them as a group? Indeed he did, Aaron. Captain Lyle held a pep talk of sorts, and he spoke to all of his, each of his soldiers in the Apache troop you now see rolling toward Iraq. He began by saying, and I'm quoting Captain Lyle here, we're just doing what's right. This is a case of them, him, and us. Them being the Iraqi people, Captain Lyle said, him being Saddam Hussein, and us being the United States Army. Captain Lyle went on to say the Iraqi people have been gassed and murdered by this tyrant. He has to be removed. He said, we are marching, we are invading to liberate the people of Iraq. He said, this is one of the greatest events the world has ever seen, and we want the American people to see it. And did they cheer? What, how, did, how, you, did, how did those young men react to that talk? Well, 
Well, they gave the cry, they gave the, the call of, of this unit, which is, of course, Gary Owen. And the, the, the historical background on that is, and I won't try to sing it for you, but Gary Owen was Custer's marching song. It has always been the 7th Cavalry's marching song. Uh, and, of course, the original 7th Cavalry was formed at Fort Riley, Kansas in 1866. And it later, of course, became the famous division uh, or famous cavalry unit, which was wiped out by the Sioux and Cheyenne at the Little Bighorn. Uh, times have changed since then, of course, but the 7th Cavalry uh, now has a watchword, which is Gary Owen. And, of course, they have their army cheer whenever they uh, hear something they approve of. And the army cheer, which Captain Lyle was given, was hoo-ha. Back to you, Aaron. Is that... The history of these units and all of that, the cheers, is it all important in what sense? It's really important bringing a unit together, bringing a lot of people from different backgrounds together. You want to meld them into a unit. They're all wearing the same uniform, you yeah. know. And so what is it that makes their team distinctive? And they've got regimental histories. This is the 7th Cavalry. This is the, a certain squadron of the 7th Cavalry. There are different squadrons at various different divisions, but they're all part of the tradition of the 7th Cavalry Regiment, which has a great and proud tradition in the United States Army. You do. You have these, these units are, uh, they are in many respects marvelous things to see. You get, you got a kid from Anniston, Alabama, and another kid from Brooklyn, New York, and somebody from out in Arizona somewhere, and someone out in Texas, and, and all over the country, and Alaska, and here and there and everywhere. And one of, the, one of the things that has to be done is to make them, I'll, I'll use the word bond, to, to become a unit, a team. And all of the things that are done, the training that's done, the cheers, the gathering, to make them a family, if you will, because when it goes down, that's what they have hard. to be. Absolutely. You've got you to gotta have some good times to get ready for the bad times. And part of the good times is belonging to a unit that's got a great tradition that you can be proud of and you can talk about and you can write home about. And uh, you got your own motto and your cheer and when you do your sports you might have a t-shirt with your, with your um, crest on it yeah. and, and so forth. We ran a story the other night about a young Marine who was having a tough time and, um, some, and it, was, it was a bit uncomfortable to watch. I mean, he, was, he was quite scared and a, a number of viewers wrote in and, and said you shouldn't have run that and, and it was interesting what I liked about the story and still like about the story was not that there was a story of a scared young man because there are lots of scared young men out there on the eve of war. Uh, that's human nature. It is how the rest of the unit still held on to him, still cared about him, still tried to, to, to get him through it. This was a young Marine and it was so noble, I thought how they had not shunned him despite the fact he really was, as I remember them saying in boot camp a long, long time ago, a real screw up at that point. Um, they were not going to leave him behind in any sense of the term. And that's really what you're talking about. That's exactly right. We take care of the men and women in the United States Armed Forces. They, they belong to us. They belong to each other. We love them. We respect them. We develop them. We want them to be all they can be. And we're not going to let any of them fall behind if we can do anything to prevent that. And that's what's so great about the volunteer force, if I can say that, Aaron, because back you know, in the draft force, we had great young men and women also in that force. But many of them, they didn't exactly, some of them didn't want to be there. And a lot of them didn't want to be there. Some, a lot of them would say, I had a great experience because yeah. it was really tough, you know, and, and I watched a lot of people fall out. But in those days, if you wanted to fall out, we would have kept you in. You know, yeah. why well, he's not going to get out that easy, you know. Yeah. Now, you have to want to stay in and you want to be part of that team. And so it's a very positive, constructive force. And you know, when, the, when all the patriotism is done, what study after study in battlefields show is that the troops end up fighting for each other. They fight for the team. They fight for their self-respect. They fight for what they uh, share with each other in that tank, or that Bradley, in that infantry squad. That's what it's really all about. Just, uh, uh, David, stay on this for a bit. Um, just for people who have joined us um, just in the last uh, 
you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes at least, who were not with us at the top at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, let me just get a couple of things in. This is the 7th Cavalry. These are live pictures. They are moving across southern Iraq. They had a little resistance when they came across. They've had none since. They are moving. Uh, pretty quickly and ultimately they will be heading to Baghdad and they are the tip of the spear to use the term as we report this and as we watch this and with some excitement um, certainly in our voices we ought not forget that the headline of of tonight um, is this, the worst of the sort of news we can possibly report that a helicopter uh, Marine CH-46 helicopter crashed in Kuwait tonight, 16 people on board, some of them American, some of them British, and we don't know precisely the breakdown yet. There was one report that it was 12 and uh, 4, but it, it may turn out to be some other number. In any case, at some point it doesn't matter whether uh, it, it was 12 Americans or, or 11 and the rest were British. There are good and young men who died in that helicopter accident. There's no evidence that there was any hostile fire that brought it down. It was an accident. These things have happened before. There was an accident not long ago, a week or so ago, that also claimed four lives, a similar sort of thing, but a smaller helicopter. This is a pretty good-sized helicopter that was carrying 16 uh, young men. We know, as General Clark pointed out a little bit ago, there is something, as you look at this narrow slice of the ground war, and that's what you're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that the Marines have moved across. We've known that for some hours now. And one of the questions, General, is we haven't heard from, we, there are correspondents embedded with the Marine units, and it is very possible uh, that they have not been, they are not able to file, tell us what they're doing, but we believe they are headed for Basra, right? We think they're headed in that direction, certainly, and what they're doing there and what they're going to do when they get there is unclear. We know there was a big artillery barrage uh, that targeted I guess they were targeted on known Iraqi positions, some occupied, some unoccupied previously. Okay. Uh, Jamie McIntyre, hang on one second. I know you have more in the helicopter. I was just handed a note, um, and just let me read it to you. This is according to the Washington Post. U.S. intelligence officials believe Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, possibly accompanied by one or both of his powerful sons, was still inside the compound in southern Baghdad early yesterday when it was struck by a barrage of U.S. bombs and cruise missiles. Um, this takes us back almost literally 24 hours ago. It was a little later when we started reporting um, what it was, the sense that it was Saddam Hussein. But the Washington Post in a story by Walter Pincus and Bob Woodward and Dana Priest are reporting that intelligence officials believe that he was in that bunker perhaps with his two sons, and I think the story of his two sons is pretty well known by now, both powerful and dangerous people, uh, that he was in that bunker, and it, it, I guess, again brings up the question, did he survive, was it a double, and all of the other things, so we'll come back to that. Jamie, I interrupted you, you were about to talk, uh, add to the detail on this helicopter accident earlier tonight. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that we do, we, we were being careful about what we said about the crew makeup, because there was some confusion it has been sorted out now and it turns out that this was a, an American helicopter, U.S. Marine helicopter with a crew of four uh, U.S. Marines and they were carrying a dozen British commandos uh, presumably to take them to uh, a mission in Iraq uh, when the helicopter crashed uh, about nine miles south of the Iraqi border. So uh, it turns out at this point uh, Great Britain, the United States' uh, staunchest ally, has actually suffered the greatest number of casualties so far. 12 British commandos, four U.S. Uh, Marines killed in that accident. It'll, it'll be interesting uh, to see how the British, how this changes the mood in Britain. As, as most of you know, uh, the British population, perhaps 25% supported the notion of sending uh, British soldiers into this conflict. And now they will deal with the worst kind of news, that some of their young men have died and they will because this is what always happens in moments like this certainly in the early moments like this uh, we would presume they will rally around um, their soldiers if not their prime minister but perhaps their prime minister too can i uh, say something about these pictures that we're seeing yes you know there was great a great 
a bit of angst at the Pentagon about whether it was uh, such a good idea to allow reporters to actually accompany units into combat. A lot of debate back and forth. Of course, the reporters have been whining for years uh, that the Pentagon doesn't allow adequate access. Uh, and then the military has always said that having reporters along would, would complicate the mission, would distract commanders, they'd be worried about p protecting the reporters. Um, logistically, it wouldn't work. It would be hard to file. Um, so it's very interesting to see how this is working. Now, of course, this is the very early stages. Right. Uh, Walter Rogers did encounter, they did encounter some opposition. He even, uh, I think, had a shell go off uh, near him. Uh, so he's certainly uh, in the thick of combat, but, you know, they, they could be heading for a real uh, firefight at some point, and it'll be very interesting to see how it, that turns out and how it all works. The other thing, of course, that strikes me is, um, you know, we're interested in these pictures, and the Pentagon is interested, and, of course, everybody watching is interested, but how about the families of all of these uh, soldiers yes. in the 7th the Cavalry who are sitting at home now watching their uh, loved ones as they're actually engaged in combat. Uh, this is just really unprecedented that uh, they could be watching live on the battlefield as their, uh, as their loved ones, their family members race across the desert of Iraq uh, for what may be a potential confrontation. Well, we share with them, with those families, if they are watching and how, how fast must their hearts be beating, those moms and dads and brothers and sisters right now. I, I can't imagine anybody who has a relative in this uh, unit not calling a friend or a family and saying, look, they're on CNN. Uh, I, I can't imagine they wouldn't be glued to the television uh, at this point uh, if you had a personal stake in what's going on here. It, it's a remarkable thing. Our hearts and, and are with all, all those families tonight. Um, one of the things about, it seems to me, about being able to show this sort of thing live is that it brings the reality of what is going on into much sharper focus. Um, and we're not embarrassed to say that we worry about the well-being of those people out there, those young men out there. They are at the, uh, the earliest and best stages of their lives. Um, so much is fun when you're 19 years old and, and they're about to deal with some of the ugliest things that humans do. Uh, we hope that they all come back safe and sound and, and soon and very soon. Uh, I wonder, uh, Ryan Chilcote is with the 101st, if my memory serves me right. He's one of our embedded reporters out there. Uh, they're preparing to go to work, if you will. This is another one of the great and legendary uh, units. Uh, Ryan, can you hear me? Absolutely, Aaron. Uh, I'm with the 101st Airborne right now at an assembly area. The 101st moved out of its camp. It's now at this assembly area, basically in a posture ready uh, should they get the call to go to war, to move into Iraq. Now, we're going to take the camera off me and show you what they're working on right now before that happens. Uh, what you see in front of you is, well, it's uh, about 7 o'clock in the morning here in the Kuwaiti desert. Soldiers waking up. They slept in these uh, sleeping holes. Uh, they're digging them. This is a defensive mechanism to protect them from any kind of uh, incoming fire. Also, hopefully you can see some of the five-ton trucks. That's what these soldiers have been moving around in. Uh, each five-ton truck takes 18 soldiers, two squads of soldiers in each truck. So uh, a lot of attention paid to where they put everything, because that's a lot of people. A lot of uh, effort right now being paid to where to put all the backpacks, water, and food. Um, soldiers are pretty much up now, uh, Got it, been getting up over the last hour. Pretty interesting though, uh, pretty, I, I don't know if, how well you can see this picture, Aaron, can you see this? Oh, we see it very, very well. We could hardly see it more clearly. Um, you know, helmets strapped on, um, a little milling around. Um, General, sure. when you look, when you, General, when this you look at This is the a, uh, 187th Infantry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, this is, this is the 187th Infantry Regiment, also known as the uh, 3rd Brigade that you're seeing right now, 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne. Uh, most of these soldiers that you're seeing actually uh, just finished a tour, a six-month tour of duty in Afghanistan and returned home to the States about seven months ago. So they have been on the road, so to speak, uh, not at all uh, green 
uh, to when it comes to desert warfare. These guys know what they're doing. Um, but uh, that's the scene here at uh, the assembly area in the Kuwaiti desert, uh, 101st Airborne, uh, still here in Kuwait, uh, in a posture now, uh, awaiting word. Should they get the word, they are now prepared to move into Iraq. And do they, uh, um, you want to jump in? I do, because I want to, you, you were going to ask me, what do look, I think about when yeah, I see those of troops? Course they look, those troops look great. Now, I'm looking at the troops, they're, they're all in uniform. They got their gear, they got their stuff together, they're working on load plans. You look at those men, they're physically fit, they're ready. That's a, that's a great army. You can take one look at that. Just hang, and, hang on one second. And, and, and Ryan, feel that. A, a, Ryan, ask your cameraman just to pan over again, uh, off you and onto, uh, onto the troops for a second. General, go ahead. When you look at those, look at those troops, Aaron, and, and they got Absolutely. their gas masks on, they got their helmets on. See, now, these guys are walking around there, they're Absolutely. loading, there's a guy finishing up shaving there, but he's got his gas mask on, he's ready. Uh, they got their flak jackets on. These guys are, they, they're well disciplined, they're well trained. If they had to move in five seconds, they could do it. Look at the bags packed on the side of that truck. They know what they're doing. That's a disciplined, capable outfit. And when you look at the faces of the troops and you look at the physical fitness that's there, these are men who mean business. That little apparatus on the top of the helmet is that's night a little, Yeah, that's a, that's a device to hold the night vision goggle and it flips down so they can put it in front of them and the front of their eye and see with it. Chin and straps are down, fastened. And you compare that to the pictures that you remember from our days in Vietnam. Yeah. Remember those guys, uh, you know, with the ragged t-shirts and the helmets off and, and, and this is a different army today. And just, uh, uh, just briefly, do you think a lot of that has to do with that it is a volunteer army? A lot of it has to do with the volunteer army. A lot of it has to do with the fact that in the last 30 years, we really have learned to develop the men and women who serve in the United States Armed Forces. Are they are given professional development. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can't be a sergeant without going to school. You can't get your next stripe without going to another school. You don't get a second stripe without going to another school. You're constantly being challenged and developed. And you take those lessons and you're trained and you bring them back and bring young people up. It's a, it's a tremendous organization that's been built. I always learn um, when we, you and I talk strategy, I learn something. But the, what I've always especially appreciated is we'll look at the same picture sometimes, General, and how you see it and what you see in it uh, from a, through a soldier's eye uh, that the rest of us, quite honestly, would not see. Walt Rogers, uh, who's in the, with the 7th Cavalry, 7th Cavalry, that's the large picture on the right people uh, making their way through the desert. Walt? Hello, Aaron. Uh, another one of our desert vignettes for you. If the cameraman's looking the way I think he is, you're looking on another Bedouin encampment here in the southern Iraqi desert. Uh, these people live uh, by herding sheep and goats. And in a, in a second, if Charlie can pan to the right, you can see a herd of goats here. This is just uh, mind-blowing uh, to see these huge armored units. Um, you better slow it down. They're stopping, guys. Um, these huge armored units moving through Bedouin encampments. Uh, the, uh, the 7th Cavalry stopped now, and out on the horizon, we can continue to see the helicopters. There's one thing, Aaron, I need to tell you, which is very interesting. Uh, the actual launch hour for the 7th Cavalry was not supposed to be until about midnight tonight. But the, uh, the uh, decision makers in the Pentagon apparently were so angry at the uh, tactical ballistic missiles that the Iraqis fired across at the United States uh, troops in northern Kuwait. So angry that the uh, tactical missiles were uh, fired into Kuwait that the, uh, the H hour, that is the launch hour, was moved ahead by 24 hours. And we're, the 7th Cavalry, at least, is a full day and a half ahead of schedule. Out on the horizon, you're seeing the Kiowa helicopters. And if you can see a small assortment of animals out there, those are probably Bedouin goats. The Bedouins live off those goats. There's a small shelter there uh, in, the, in the foreground, and the Bedouin family lives there. This is about the third Bedouin encampment we've passed. 
and they, then they just appear dumbstruck, uh, awestruck by this huge mechanized unit which is rolling across the desert. These people don't have a a automobiles. Often they move by camels, and all of a sudden they're seeing uh, camels like nothing they ever saw before with 120 millimeter guns sticking out. Aaron? It's just, uh, you, you've obviously stopped. Um, and just give me a sense of what's happening. The whole uh, movement has stopped down for any particular reason that you can discuss? Uh, when they stop like this, it is usually because they sense a ho uh, they have an indication there's a hostile force in the area. Every time that we've stopped previously uh, in, in an, an array like this, uh, we have taken an incoming shell and uh, consequently the 7th Cavalry has stopped and they're in a high state of alert uh, while the helicopters are out uh, doing a zone reconnaissance out over the horizon. I can see at least four helicopters in the air and the helicopters, as I say, are conducting surveillance to make sure that the, uh, the cavalry, which is paused now, the tanks which have stopped, uh, do not have uh, hostile forces on their flanks. So what you're watching is, the, uh, is uh, additional reconnaissance out over the horizon by the Kiowa helicopters uh, and the tanks are stopping for a few seconds at this moment. But uh, I believe it's reconnaissance and as I say, that we've stopped before, uh, once at the berm, once at the border crossing, and once further into the into southern Iraq, we took incoming shells. We can see, uh, Walt, we can see very clearly here, uh, I see two soldiers who have jumped out of one of the tanks. Uh, they're now walking on the, on the opposite side, the side we can't see, but we saw that very clearly. Again, uh, these are live pictures, uh, certainly never before in... Uh, history have reporters been able to provide our constituents, our viewers, with this kind of access uh, and do it in a way that does not compromise in any way, shape, or form the security of those young men and all part of this complicated relationship that's developed between the Pentagon and a multitude of news organizations. 500 reporters are embedded with units across the, the theater right now, some on ships, some with Marines, some with these Army units. Um, they, are, they have been living with them, some cases for several weeks, in some cases probably in no case any less than a week. Uh, they have been living with them, sleeping with them. Uh, these units are not expected to care for them. Uh, though bonding is bonding and trust is trust and hopefully uh, everybody trusts everybody at this point. I know that anytime we do anything like this there is always concern. Uh, viewers have and understandably so that something will say either uh, in an effort to get something quickly on the air or uh, accidentally. Look how clear that shot is. They're stretching their legs for one thing I would think, General. I would think so. Yeah. Um, we understand that concern at the same time, uh, General, um, you'd slap my hand pretty good if we did anything wrong here and so far I've been slapped. You're not concerned we're giving anything away here. There's no landmark out there. There's no landmark at all. I mean, there's no way that if anyone were watching this, they'd know where this is. As far as the Iraqis are concerned, this could have been filmed in the United States and, and we could just be playing it now to amuse the listening audience, uh, yeah. viewing it. I mean, that's not true, but there's no landmark here. There's no way this, in no way does this compromise the operation, except by the fact that we are announcing that we're inside Iraq. And the rules of, without going through all the detail, at some point over the next days or weeks, we really ought to spend so you can see the, the Bedouin uh, goats out in the desert. Um, it's just, it's, you know, we've been looking at these pictures for an hour and five minutes now, and they are no less dramatic, if you will, uh, than they were when we first started. There's a couple of things uh, that did go on today that just stay on the picture. Let me catch viewers up a little bit. Um, for those of you who haven't had TVs on all day or haven't had the radio on, don't know the events of the day, uh, there was earlier today um, the Americans launched an air attack into Baghdad, a couple of locations. Uh, we clearly saw earlier in the day one building, a building that we believe uh, Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister, had an office in uh, that was hit. It was burning. This now all 
seems like a long time ago. It was this early uh, this afternoon. Um, in Kuwait, and Walt alluded to this, the Iraqis threw uh, a number of missiles, I think 12 uh, by our count, uh, from their side over, uh, most of them landed harmlessly in the desert. Uh, no incidents, no casualties at all there, but that action did take place. Periodically through the day uh, in Kuwait, the air raid sirens would go off up on close to the front lines. Uh, soldiers would uh, grab their gas masks and put them on for fear of a chemical attack. Uh, those fears, thankfully, proved unfounded, but nobody's taking any chances. Again, that's a Bedouin tent out in the middle of, and when I say nowhere, I mean nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere in the southern Iraqi desert uh, in, a, in a herd, or I guess it'd be a herd of goats. Um, um, so there were these, these missile exchanges, if you will. There also is about a 50-mile line on the Kuwaiti border where there was a very heavy artillery barrage that went on. Uh, earlier today that was part of the preparation of the battlefield and as that was going on or shortly after that went on is probably more correct uh, the Marines made their move across the border and we believe that those Marine units are part of the units that will make their way to Basra which is a major city I think it's the second largest city it is second largest city in Iraq uh, they will make their way there that is a very important marker in how this thing is going. Basra is a city, mostly of Shias, it was a city of considerable violence. After the first Gulf War, a rebellion, an anti-Saddam rebellion, and there is a strong belief that when Americans and British uh, soldiers or Marines get there, whoever gets there first, uh, that they will be warmly received and that will be a great aid to the operation. Again, um, this 7th Cavalry Unit has stopped down uh, we see and you see as clearly as we can uh, soldiers getting down, stretching, perhaps preparing, as Wald indicated. There may be some suspicion that there is, uh, there are hostile forces nearby that will have to be tended to. Uh, the helicopters, which you can't now see, I think Walt said four helicopters associated with this unit are flying around doing the reconnaissance. There's one at least, one of the pilots a female pilot, just uh, for those of you who, who think that bridge has not been crossed, it has been crossed a long time ago. Um, and they are at now a little bit after 7 in the morning, 7.10 in the morning uh, in Iraq, making their way, just if we can lose the banner for a second or, or frame the shot a little differently, that would help, uh, making their way. And that's where we've been for the last hour. Thank you. Um, and these young men, there are four in each tank, and they are, and, and, uh, and Bradley fighting vehicle as well, and they are by and large uh, young men, 18, 19 years old, probably a sergeant who's a bit older, 26 or so, uh, in charge of each one of those, and a young captain as well who has responsibility for all that you see unfolding. The tip of the spear, they will make the first contact. Behind them will come the infantry. Walt. Yes, Aaron. We're watching the helicopters again flying that zone reconnaissance. We've been traveling in this very broad pattern, a fan-like shape, uh, for several hours now. And I would assume that the, we're one, one of the reasons we're stopping now is just to let the, uh, the soldiers inside the tanks in the Bradley fighting vehicles stretch their legs. We do not appear to be under any immediate threat. And the reason we can say that is because everyone's outside the tank now just stretching their legs and uh and uh getting some air those uh, tanks are extraordinarily cramped inside uh i was sitting in the gunner seat riding in a gunner seat last week and i don't see how they can survive in there you bounce around so much uh that you have to wear a helmet or you're or you're going to get your head smashed in with all the steel around you the drivers uh, the driver excuse me the uh, commander of the tank and the loader have been standing for probably uh seven or eight hours now standing in that turret going up. So a little pause on the, on the rush to Baghdad is probably more than a little in order. Um, again, uh, we are seeing uh, the uh, soldiers from the 7th Cavalry outside their tanks now. Uh, again, uh, perhaps even opening their MREs, getting a little breakfast, given the hour here. It's about uh, 12 past 7 in the morning. Aaron? 
Walter, uh, just uh, hang on. We're not going anywhere. We're not going away from you at all. We want to take care of um, a, a little more reporting that we can do. Uh, uh, there are there are, uh, essentially now, if you will, are a couple stories in play. There is this terrible helicopter accident where um, 12 British commandos died and four Americans died, four American Marines. That happened earlier, um, and that's one story we're keeping track of. Second story we're keeping track of as the land war unfolds in front of us, literally in front of us, uh, is our reports rather that uh, U.S. intelligence officials believe now that uh, Saddam Hussein, perhaps one or both of his sons, was still inside a South Baghdad compound when the air attack that started this whole thing uh, 26 and a half hours ago when those missiles hit that compound. David Ensor, who does national security reporting for us, has been doing national security reporting for us tonight. Uh, David, can you uh, add to what we know? Well, you've been uh, showing the public uh, the work in progress that the military campaign in Iraq is. Uh, the uh, intelligence war is a work in progress, too. And just to take you inside it briefly, uh, there is a real debate going on between uh, intelligence officials and uh, administration officials over whether Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein is still alive or not, or whether he was injured perhaps. Uh, George Tenet, the CIA director, uh, at the time that he uh, reported to the president that there was this possibly unique opportunity to, uh, to hit the leadership of Iraq, apparently uh, uh, sources are saying he, he really did have evidence that uh, was fairly convincing that uh, Saddam Hussein himself and possibly his sons as well might be in that compound which was of course subsequently attacked heavily by the United States so uh, there is still a debate and, and a lot of work going on a lot of intelligence analysis of evidence going on as to really what happened is Saddam Hussein still alive there those tapes were of course produced subsequently showing Saddam Hussein talking to uh, the Iraqi people on television uh, and uh, the question is uh, some are arguing that those tapes might have been made protectively, uh, num numerous tapes perhaps uh, for different scenarios, uh, and, and one of them, the appropriate one, brought up and broadcast after Saddam might, might already be badly injured or dead. Uh, there are others, however, who are analyzing the tapes carefully, saying that, uh, that on balance they think the voice is his, uh, the, the, the way he talks, uh, that's Saddam. Uh, and that uh, the, the fact that he, said, that he talked about morning prayers and talked about the attack around the time of morning prayers suggests that this was, was what the Iraqis said it was, was a leader who had survived an attempt on his life and was still talking. So uh, this is very much a, a debate and a work in progress. Uh, as far as we know, it's not clear yet whether Saddam is alive or dead. There are some arguing on both sides of it, and they're trying to gather more intelligence as we speak. Aaron? David, let me just ask a couple quick questions, and, and none of them, believe, or, or particularly not the first one, is in any sense uh, to embarrass you. Are you able to match the reporting at this point, because it gives us a second source, and then we can comfortably, uh, comfortably report this, that intelligence officials do in fact believe he was in that bunker, uh, and perhaps his sons as well, at the time uh, that they were hit by the cruise missiles. I've spoken to a senior intelligence official who said that at the time that George Tenet went and talked to the president, there was quite convincing evidence okay. that there were senior intelligence officials there, that there were senior Iraqi officials there, very likely including, very likely including Saddam, but not definitely, no. And when you talk about this debate that's going on, is he alive, is he dead, was that him, was that a double, was it an old tape, were those his glasses? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have all, those of us who have been doing <laughs> yeah. this, we've all been, we've been talking about this for a day, almost literally. Um, the, the debate centers around what? What, uh, what are the things that one side uh, argues that the other side disagree, uh, disagrees with? <laughs> Well, as, as you, you mentioned some of them, I mean, there's the question of uh, uh, the very strong evidence that he was there, they believe, uh, and yet uh, he, this tape was fairly quickly uh, produced. It may have been uh, produced after the event. Uh, that's what the Iraqis say. It does look like it is him, uh, the initial voice analysis and so forth. There are, however, also some other checks that are being run, and there is uh, you know, some controversy, certainly within the CIA that I know of, about whether the tapes really are him or whether there's a body double. 
Uh, some people talk about those glasses and say he's never worn glasses like that before. Uh, all sorts of questions being raised. So uh, I don't know all of what's going on uh, you know, behind closed doors in the intelligence community. I just know that there is considerable debate and ferment about this issue. And obviously, it's an important one. Uh, although, there are also uh, officials who are saying, uh, look, uh, <laughs> he's increasingly irrelevant. Uh, he's now having to run for his life and hide. Yeah. Uh, he can't really deliver orders to anybody in a meaningful way. Increasingly, uh, his sovereignty is, uh, is slipping away from him. So uh, although the U.S. obviously wants to get him, uh, they're less worried about what he can do uh, right now. Uh, David, please, don't, please stay with us here. Um, General Clark, two things. Um, do, you think it, do you think this, this is so speculative, so we label it as such, is it possible that what this debate, as this debate is going on, the importance of whether he is dead or alive explains in any way, shape, or form the way the battle plan is unfolding? I think that's the best explanation for, that I can imagine for why the battle plan is unfolding the way it is. If you were certain that Saddam were alive, if you were certain that he had iron grip on the command and control, and that he wasn't leaving, then by this time you'd, you'd have said, okay, we've struck at him. Um, he's tasted a little bit of cold steel, but the best thing to do is get this thing over with, finish this off. But if he's not, if you can spare Baghdad and the Iraqi people that destruction, think of the gains you've made in terms of your relations with the rest of the Arab world and, and world public opinion. And so and with minimal risk to your force. Now, if you look at the defenses that came out of Baghdad and that we saw earlier, mm -hmm. um, they didn't look very well organized. They weren't very cohesive. Uh, and that's an indicator that something's loose there. Because Baghdad was extremely well defended in 1991. And I talked to many pilots who flew it in the Gulf War, and they were quite concerned whenever they went around Baghdad. We didn't see that. What we saw was scattered, scattered fire. So maybe there's something to this. Now, I feel like I've walked you into a, a small corner here because I heard you say the other day, I was surprised to hear you say it, that getting Saddam is not nearly the same as getting Osama bin That's Laden. Right. So square what you just said to me with what you said the other night. Because the leader of a head of, the head of state is always a legitimate target, and you always want to take out the enemy's command and control. And in this case, you've got it. But if you had overrun Iraq, you had taken Baghdad, you had destroyed the Republican guards and taken the special security organization down, Saddam is irrelevant. So what I was saying was, let's don't get fixated on the personage of Saddam Hussein. We're after him because he's in command. And what's significant about this right now is that we knocked out the top command. It has, or we may have, that's what the debate's about. It's not that it's Saddam Hussein, you know, war criminal, cruel tyrant. Right. It's the fact that this is the top level command that's been holding the whole state together. Without all that apparatus under him, he was nothing. He was not a cult figure like Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden could go from state to state and pick up support. Saddam Hussein outside of Iraq, without the special security organization as East German trained guards, was nothing. But taking him out at the outset of a war, if we've done that, it's huge. And so, circling back again, um, the planners, the, the civilian and military planners, are, are, want to see, in a sense, want to see the, re the Iraqis react. They want to know now if, if he is dead, if he is uh, badly injured, if, 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 how does that change the plan before they have to commit a massive air attack? And no matter how you slice it and dice it, no matter how smart uh, the weapons are, one of the problems in a massive air attack is that you're, there's going to be civilian casualties. Not, air, I think, uh, you know, if 99% if of these bombs and missiles work perfectly, there's still 1% that do not, that hit something they ought not hit. And that's one of the things that for 
both the obvious humanitarian reasons and for a lot of good, important international political reasons. Uh, the U.S. government does not want civilian casualties in the Arab world. It, it's something they're trying to avoid for both of those reasons. If you can avoid that, all to the better, and you save about $50 billion, too. That's exactly right. And, I mean, what you would think is going on behind the scenes <clears throat> in Iraq, if Saddam is really down and his sons are disabled, is the other Iraqi leaders are trying to take stock of the situation. Maybe we're in contact with them. We've been emailing people all over. We just don't know what's happening. Is that what we've literally been emailing people That's all over? what the news agencies yeah. are reporting. Well, I'm only a commentator You, you, you believe everything you read. I huh? believe a lot of it. <laughs> because we're very good and we know a lot. And, and we've been uh, trying to get in contact with them and say, don't be stupid. We have. And maybe, what if, what, what if you got an email back and the guy said, I don't know what's happening, I haven't gotten any orders. We might then say to him, well, go ask. Find out who's in charge and come tell us. And you may you, save your family this way. That's right. I mean, you think, but that's a pretty remarkable thing, isn't it? It's, there are, Does that sort of thing work? Could it work? It could, but this is highly speculative. We really don't know. Yeah. what's happening on this at all. Well, one thing we know, because you're looking at it, all of us are looking at it, the 7th Cavalry is uh, in southern Iraq. They have paused, perhaps to stretch and rest, grab a bite to eat. They have been working.